If you're in any way involved in marketing your business today, you need to check out They Ask, You Answer for a few key reasons. First off, it's going to walk you through how the internet has totally changed the buying process for everyone across the board. It's going to lay out why trust is the lifeblood of any successful sales process and how you can use content marketing as an advantage to build trust and sell more stuff online in a way that's not scummy and really helpful for everyone across the board. So without further ado, let's dive into just the good parts of They Ask, You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. If you don't know me, I'm Matt Woods, and if you want the full book notes to this and a bunch of other books, just go to mattwoods.io for the full thing and a bunch of other resources. Let's get to it. The first thing you need to know about understanding inbound marketing, the way it's laid out in this book, is that you can't hide the bad things people say about you because of the internet. If you try and do that, you're kind of like an ostrich who's sticking his head in the sand and just pretending that just because uh, it's hiding around in the dirt that no one else knows what's going on. Your customers are smarter than that. And so you want to be not like an ostrich, but like CarMax, because CarMax, as he points out in the book, did two things that most companies simply weren't willing to do. The first really smart thing they did is that they admitted they had a problem, which is so hard for companies to do when you just want to paint yourself in the best light. But the reality is used car buyers knew that things didn't smell right and they didn't trust the people on the other side of the counter who were trying to sell them the car. So CarMax totally flipped things on its head, changed the way they talked about their cars, the way they educated consumers and shared information about their cars, their processes, and they did whatever it took to re-earn consumer trust. And because of that, they got to reinvent the rules of how the used car industry worked, of how people bought and sold used cars. Everyone had to bend to their rules. And this is what happens when people put customer trust in the driver's seat. The greatest companies that reset the rules for everyone else are obsessed with consumer fear. And the reason why is because of this simple formula, that if you have a buying process, whether that's used cars or software or anything else in the world that you want to sell, if you remove the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty out of that process, all you're left with is trust between the buyer and the seller. And that is exactly what you want to aim for in today's modern buying process. And this stacks up with other companies who are doing this. If you look at everyone from Amazon to Shopify to even newer brands like Glossier, they're listening to customers, they're building trust and changing how they sell. And everyone else who isn't doing this as well is having to bend to their way of doing things. Uh, and to get closer to the customer and build up that trust. So how do they do it? Well, ultimately, it boils down to this thing called content marketing, or at least this is one of the main ways it happens, the way that's advocated in the book. And this can look a lot of times like a blog post or even an Instagram post on social media, basically anywhere where consumer attention is, how are you helping people make a smarter decision in their buying process and removing that fear through helpful content that's honest and transparent. To help us focus on the most effective types for our content marketing, uh, Marcus lays down five big types that we should really focus on if we want to drive sales and, and get people to buy. And those are problems, pricing and costs versus reviews and best in class. And we'll break each of those down and talk about kind of what goes into each of those types and what makes them different and sets them apart. But before we do that, I want to talk about the inverted triangle of influence. And there's really just three factors in here. You may notice that a lot of the things that were on the other slide that we want to create content about were pretty sensitive, things like pricing, things that people want to keep hidden. But instead, we're going to flip that on its head because what happens with most people in their marketing is they tend to create their stuff uh, based on what the competition is doing first. They give them the most influence because one of the big objections is, I don't want the competition to use our information against us. What if they know our pricing? What if they know what we say in our sales process? What if they know what is good and bad about us? But the reality is, those aren't the most important people. Uh, but they sway a lot. And 
on top of that, you're also uh, not creating the content that your customers always want to hear because you're tailoring it for these bad fits, right? People who you don't want to scare away, but you're not sure that they'll buy, right? If you'd say that your product isn't perfect for everyone, uh, that's kind of a really scary thing to do. And so we tend to make our stuff too broad and not be as honest or transparent as we could be. But really the only people that matter, the only people we want to focus our content on are our customers. And that's the assumption. That's the going forward place. That's the point of leverage that's going to make our content different and effective. And so that brings us to our first type of content problems. And the key here is no matter what you need to address the elephant in the room. And simply put, this just means that you are focusing on the bad things that people might think or might say about you before they say it. So are you diving into what the competition says is a negative about your product? What other people are going to say, you know, oh, you shouldn't go with company X because this reason. And on top of that, you also want to anticipate and come right out of the gate with uh, mentioning whatever buyers might see as potential negatives about your product or service or whatever you're selling. Uh, in the past, you might have been tempted to cover this up, but customers aren't dumb, they're not ignorant, and with the internet, they're gonna find out about these things anyways through reviews and through what other people are saying, and you can't control that 100%. But what you can do is come out of the gate and anticipate these big elephant problems that people are are going to say there's actually a really helpful exercise that he mentions in the book of kind of fear brainstorming which is if you take your team and just come up with the top 10 to 20 fears worries questions that would cause someone not to buy from your company a lot of times those are never mentioned on most people's websites but if you talk about them you'll it'll help you stand out from the pack and and build trust right out of the gate before people even talk to you about buying or hit that buy button or whatever it is the second kind is pricing. This is a huge bucket of content to focus on because most people just don't. And it's so frustrating as a customer. I'm sure you can relate. When you know the business has the answer, you know they have their pricing, but it feels like they're hiding it from you. And your customers are not going to give you the benefit of the doubt most times and assume you're hiding it for a good reason. They'll just be mad that you hit it. And so there's an interesting stat that he did here little bit of a back of the envelope calculation, I think, but he asserts that fewer than 10% of businesses actually address pricing and costs on their website, which is crazy. So if you're one of these that do address pricing in a transparent way, by default, you're going to stand out. And so there's a few easy ways to address pricing on your site. First off, you want to identify the most important things you sell, the things that will make you the most money. Maybe it's the highest uh, ticket dollar items. Maybe it's the things you sell the most of, whatever that is. That's the most important thing to focus on. Once you do that, check over your content and see if you have at least one article and one video for each of those important products or services that you sell. If you don't have one, this is a ripe area for you to focus on and you need to prioritize it until you have this covered. Once you do that, make sure you publish it to your website, put it on your blog, make it highly visible, promote it with ads, get it out there so that people know about your pricing and it doesn't feel hidden. The results from doing this can be absolutely staggering. He gives a quick anecdote in the book where uh, the number one type of content that drove traffic leads and sales for uh, his marketing agency that he ran were related to money. So cost, salaries, pricing, this is a huge underrated category. And most people won't talk about it because they feel like their product is different. You have to explain it away that our competitors will find out or they'll scare customers away. But the reality is competitors usually already know if you explain the rationale behind why your product is different people will understand and be grateful for it and uh, prices are really only going to scare away bad fit people if they're a good fit it'll work out anyways and you'll both be grateful that you saved the time all right so let's roll into our third big type of content which is versus and comparison content if you've ever gone comparison shopping for something which is how pretty much everyone shops for a big ticket item nowadays you know the importance of of reviews and uh, stacking up the pros and cons of different types uh, of benefits, disadvantages, real life experiences for the thing you're actually trying to buy. So if you can become the source of this, it's a very, very powerful trust builder. And it's a few things 
that you can look at. First off, can you create an objective review of the top solutions that are in your industry? So can you stack all of them up, including the products and solutions from your competitors and remove yourself, take an impartial view, point out the flaws in your own product or who it might not be good with, point out where your competitors might be a better fit for certain types of companies. That is going to go further in building trust with the right types of people you get in front of um, and making sure that you filter out those bad fits as well. Kind of a line in the sand, force people to have an opinion by being more helpful. On top of that, it's also helpful to look at best in class types of content that you can make. Basically, um, can you compare different types of solutions? Can you stack up the pros and cons of one product versus another? Um, and this bleeds into another type of category that we'll talk about in just a minute. But some big principles to keep at the front of your mind when you're doing this. You want to lay out the facts about what make your top competitors stand out. It may sting if you're not used to it, but it really does make a difference because that's what you would probably want to see if you were in the customer's shoes. The other thing is try to avoid opinion whenever possible when you're talking about competitors. It's too hard to remain impartial if you let your feelings get in the way and it's too easy to slip into to things that are not based on the facts. So stick to the facts. And that finally brings us to our last two types of content, reviews and best in class. And really, I kind of bundle these together with this idea of becoming a curator without playing favorites. And can you become kind of a magnet for reviews and kind of be this, you know, guide that helps people navigate your industry? Uh, if you've ever bought things online on Amazon or anywhere else, you know that the reviews are super important. Even just looking at the Amazon reviews for this book uh, could be a huge deciding factor in whether or not you decide to go with it. So this is the last key, right? You can do your own reviews, and that's kind of more of what I think of the other content type, this versus any comparisons. Can you bring them together and be the connecting glue, the magnet, the hub for other people's reviews? And can you package that up into helpful content? Uh, some of the marketers over at Drift call this using their words, your customers' words. And I think it's an incredibly important lesson for any marketer. All right. One of the last things he talks about in the book is uh, why companies or most companies uh, won't embrace these principles of this transparent content marketing that helps people. There's a couple big things that hold people back. First off, a lot of people don't think like teachers, right? The teachers see the world differently. They're honestly curious and interested in, in helping people understand the subject matter at hand and make the best decision for them. If they're not willing to do that, if they're just looking to push their own agenda, to beef up their sales, no matter the cost to the customer, it's really hard to, to be honest and real and help people with your content. And then the last one is the scarcity mentality. If you act like it's a zero-sum game and only you can win, uh, it's really hard to, to produce content and to create this library of, of rich and helpful um, blog posts, videos, roundup articles, whatever you want to do. But if you act like you're making the pie bigger and everyone else can improve your customer's life and you have different things to offer, you're probably going to be in a pretty good position to keep doing this for a long time and see it impact your bottom line. So that's an overview of They Ask, You Answer. If you want to see the books, again, check this out on the website um, and let me know what you think about this review. What are the biggest lessons you're going to take away? And I would love to hear more about it. If you want to see more reviews, go check them out in the playlist and I hope you'll stick around. Cheers.